Welcome to Unmasking the Realities. The State of Hate in America and Pathways Forward. My name is Christopher Miller, Senior Director of Education and Community Engagement at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. The purpose of these opportunities is to engage and enlighten the public about matters related to the struggles for freedom by examining environmental, cultural, behavioral, historical, economic, and political factors that mitigate freedom and justice. Our aim is to challenge and inspire everyone to be informed citizens who can consider their respective responsibilities in the struggle for freedom and justice in whatever roles they assume. Uh, we seek to be a beacon of hope and a catalyst for greater understanding for social equity and justice. The Unmasking the Reality series began in the summer of 2020 during the convergence of a global pandemic and the largest mass protest in U.S. history. The design of this national virtual conversation series was to tackle uncomfortable contemporary topics to provoke constructive action towards justice and equity. And in 2022, we continue that objective. Uh, the discussion this evening is in partnership with the Cincinnati Regional Coalition Against Hate. This coalition was initiated in response to the scheduled speaking the uh, speaking visit of Richard Spencer at the University of Cincinnati in 2017, and it continues to grow into a significant coalition for the Cincinnati region. The coalition is a nonpartisan alliance of organizations committed to being vigilant against hate activity by supporting impacted communities and fostering acceptance, compassion, and justice for all in the Cincinnati region. I am a founding member of the coalition and the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is one of the founding organizing partners. Before we proceed with our moderator, Julie Sunderland, program manager with the Cincinnati Regional Coalition Against Hate and our remarkable panel, we will begin with a short video to kick off the discussion. I didn't hear the shots the first time. I hear them all the time now. And I suspect I'm not alone. So many of us, whether Jewish or not, whether from Squirrel Hill or not, whether in Pittsburgh that morning or not, hear those shots still. They were the modern day shots heard around the world. The opening shots in our contemporary crisis of hurt and hate. Suspects talking about all these Jews need to die. I become frustrated about what I can do as an elected leader in a city that has now witnessed the worst anti-Semitic attack in American history. It's not just about anti-Semitism. It was an attack on America. Its foundation is hate. White lives matter! White lives matter! White supremacy, white nationalism, and racism are national security threats. <laughs> The story of what's happened in Pittsburgh starts with some of the worst pain that you can imagine. And it ends with some of the best and closest relationships that uh, I could have ever hoped for. We will work together as one. We will defeat hate with love. We will be a city of compassion, welcoming to all people, no matter what your religion or where your family came from on this earth or your status.
the Torah is referred to as a tree of life. It's the source of who we are as Jews. Eleven beautiful lives were cut down in our synagogue. But we're a tree of life. More leaves will grow back. More branches will grow back. We're not letting hate close our doors, ever. Thank you. And so moderating our discussion, is Julie Sunderland. Uh, as I said before, she is the program manager with the Cincinnati Regional Coalition Against Hate, and she will introduce our outstanding panel. Once again, thank all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone at the Freedom Center. Um, thank you to our esteemed panelists. Um, we originally got together as I started this job about a year ago feeling very isolated and siloed and wanting to reach out and connect and found these amazing women who are doing work here and across the country. And so we started to make connections together and wanted to have a conversation about what's going on. And so we're going to let them introduce themselves. Um, we're gonna start with Karen Elam from the Levine Center to End Hate. So Karen, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little bit about where you're coming from. Sure. So thank you, uh, Julie, and I will just uh, reiterate what Julie said, which is that the connections that we've been able to make, um, albeit virtually, Julie and I, um, have really been extraordinarily um, helpful. Uh, I feel like I have a partner to discuss things with, et cetera. It's really been wonderful. And I want to give a quick shout out to Jackie Congedo, who made that connection for us, um, formerly at the Jewish Federation as the Community Relations Director. So the Levine Center to Hate started about four years ago uh, in the wake of what we saw on Patrice's film um, about the uh, group Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, chanting Jews will not replace us. Um, a very generous donor, uh, Todd Levine, president of the William and Mildred Levine Foundation, uh, based here in Rochester, New York, approached us and approached the Federation and said, hard to believe that this could be happening on a campus in the United States in 2017. And unfortunately, uh, at this point, we know um, that with the many other things that have happened, uh, it it's now doesn't come as a surprise, which is very unfortunate. So uh, with his generosity, the generosity of the foundation, we were able to um, craft and create uh, this initiative. And um, it has really been my great honor and pleasure to um, be the executive director. We've had an incredible steering committee, multicultural from many sectors of the community, you know, in terms of their areas of work, um, focus, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I will leave it there so that others get a chance to introduce themselves, but I'm really looking forward to this conversation this evening and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Karen. Avun uh, Taiwu is the, from the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they have got new things going on, and she's become a very valuable partner in our work as we move forward. Can you tell everyone about your work and who you are? Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this very important issue. Uh, as Julie mentioned, I work at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I'm on the criminal side, but I also serve as the Civil Rights Coordinator for the District. Uh, in my view, hate crimes prosecutions are a central part of the work that we do, seeking to uphold the rule of law, to keep our country safe, and to protect civil rights. Um, as some of you may know, uh, the Justice Department was founded in 1870, and its principal purpose was to protect the rights of Black Americans facing violence by the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacists who are trying to deny Black Americans their rights under the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, uh, in particular the right to vote, the right to free speech and assembly. I think 
uh, we've all seen in the past few years um, that there's an increased need for the Department of Justice to protect the rights of individuals to live in their communities, to practice their faith, faith and worship, um, just to go to the grocery store, shopping, vote, find housing, and to celebrate their heritage without worry about instances of hate or discrimination being committed towards them. Now, I wanna highlight a few of our recent uh, hate crimes prosecutions, but we recognize that this is, you know, kind of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, many people locally may remember a few years ago in the lower Price Hill neighborhood of Cincinnati, Samuel Witt broke into a rental home owned by an interracial couple um, and spray painted um, that apartment or home with racial slurs the slogan white power, as well as images of swastikas. In addition, Witt stabbed a knife into the floor. Um, he removed plumbing traps. He turned the gas stove up in the upstairs kitchen. He poured paint into the burners and he attempted to remove the smoke detector above the stove. A federal grand jury ultimately indicted him with criminally interfering with the right to housing by willfully intimidating the homeowners based on their race, color, and familial status. He ultimately pled guilty and was sentenced in federal court to 54 months in prison. Under that same statute last year in Columbus, this district prosecuted Douglas Schieffer, who threatened his neighbors and their guests because of their religion during an outdoor gathering at their residence. He shouted anti-Semitic slurs, obscenities, and other derogatory language about the Jewish faith. He broke the windows of one of the uh, residents. He spat at the neighbor. He also made references to gassing Jewish people, chopping them up, and burning them in ovens. Now, Schweifer ultimately pleaded guilty and was sentenced to six months in prison, a $50,000 fine and one year of supervised relief. Now these acts go to the heart of what it means to live freely within one's personal community and personal sphere. But increasingly, we're starting to see how the ideology of hate is often linked with violence and domestic terrorism um, that can have wide ranging impacts in our communities. Earlier this year, our office charged Christopher Brenner Cook of Columbus, Ohio, as well as his co-conspirators, Jonathan Allen Frost and Jackson Matthew Sewall with conspiring to provide material support to terrorists. Now, these individuals engaged in a disturbing plot to attack our country's energy infrastructure, to stoke division in our society, all in the name of white supremacy. Cook recruited others by, among other things, circulating a list of readings promoting the ideology of white supremacy and neo-Nazism. And their plan was to attack the substations or power grids with powerful rifles. They believed that the possibility of power being out for months could cause a war, even a race war, and induce the next Great Depression. Now, these co-conspirators met in Columbus um, they were provided with AR-47s. Uh, they trained. Um, when they came to Columbus, they purchased spray paint and they painted a swastika flag under a bridge of a park with the caption, join the front, which goes to show that if we ignore incidents and treat them as mere acts of vandalism, we may be missing a greater threat to our society. So these men have pleaded guilty. They're currently awaiting sentencing. So I could discuss more cases, but obviously I recognize we're at limited time, but I just wanna highlight that these cases really show that hate affects us all. And as much work as we're doing in this space, we know that these cases just reflect the tip of the iceberg as to what is occurring. Many hate crimes and other civil rights violations go unreported. With that in mind, in July, our district launched a civil rights referral initiative act, asking members of the public 
to let our office know of potential civil rights issues within the community. We recognize that for a variety of reasons, many members of the public may not feel comfortable going directly to law enforcement or may be confused about how to report incidents because in our experience, each jurisdiction can do these things differently. So the referral form is available on the U.S. Attorney's Office main website, and I think um, a link to that website has been placed in the chat. Um, and there is also the referral form. You can download it, and I think uh, Sarah hopefully can put a link to the direct download. Um, but I think the key thing is we want members of the couple the public to feel free to bring to our attention uh, potential civil rights violations, which it can include topics such as hate crimes and hate incidents. Um, now, this is not a substitute for calling the police or seeking other avenues of redress, but it does help our office get a clearer picture of what is going on in the community. Our office is primarily a litigating office and not an investigative agency. So when we receive the forms, we can refer it to the appropriate law enforcement or administrative agencies. And so the key is um, we, and I think all of us will speak to this, we have a severe need of data in this field. Um, I think hate crimes and hate incidents are severely underreported and by reporting it to us, it gives us a measure of accountability. We can follow up with law enforcement partners. We can make sure things are moving along and we can make sure things are categorized appropriately. Um, one of the other initiatives the Department of Justice is working on is the United Against Hate. And we are working to empower communities to prevent and respond to hate crimes and incidents uh, by educating the public about hate crime laws, teaching uh, individuals how to identify and report alleged hate crimes, and sharing federal, state, and local resources and tools that can help prevent hate crimes. So it's really an opportunity that we hope um, that we can learn from our neighbors as well as law enforcement officials so that we can work together and improve communication and build relationships between the communities. And we're really looking forward to working with the Cincinnati Regional Coalition Against Hate um, and other groups in our initiative. Thank you so much. That's exactly what we're talking about, the state of where hate is and pathways forward. It's amazing work that you're doing and we're, we're grateful that you are. Um, our final panelist is uh, Patrice O'Neill. Um, you can't even describe her in a word. Filmmaker, director of Not In Our Town, creator of so many amazing programs. So Patrice, if you could tell us a little bit about you and your organization. Sure, I'm really glad to be here with the, with the Center, with the Coalition Against Hate and to engage in a um, discussion, particularly based in Cincinnati. I'm really looking forward to to coming to Cincinnati and learning from all of you. I, as you said, I'm a filmmaker and, and Not In Our Town started, I think, should I use my slides or do you wanna wait? So um, Sarah, maybe you could pull up the slides and you'll you'll see. So, um, so Not In Our Town works with communities across the country to stop hate, racism and bullying and create safe, inclusive communities for all. This is a picture of people in Billings, Montana, holding menorahs. And it, it's a reminder, it's a, it's a photo by Frederick Brenner. Um, it's a reminder of the story that launched the Not In Our Town movement. Um, back many years ago, we told the story of people in Billings, Montana, standing up when white supremacists were organizing in their community. There were attacks on black churches. There were um, um, attacks on Native American, um, uh, families, um, LGBTQ people, and um, each time people in the town joined together and said, we have to stand together to fight this. So the menorahs come from an event that took place when a six-year-old Jewish boy put in a menorah in a, his window for Hanukkah. A brick was thrown through the window and it landed on his bed 
people in the town said, this is just getting more and more dangerous. What if we're all Jewish? And that year, 10,000 people put menorahs in their windows. So it's, it's, it's a show of solidarity. When something happens to one of us, we all take a stand, um, no matter who is the target. And um, when that film aired, we thought we'd do 10 town hall meetings. There were events all over the country, many of them in Ohio. And, um, and so people started using the name Not In Our Town. So for the past over 25 years now, we've been following that story. So maybe go to the mission now, Sarah, and just to say, you know, we've been telling those stories. There have been a whole, about seven other additional feature films, PBS films about community response to hate. Um, and then we've been sort of pulling together all that knowledge from communities, from on the ground action and um, sharing it online, sharing it in uh, m meetings, network meetings, national network meetings with communities. Um, but I think we've learned about the power of storytelling. What happens when you tell a story and what can one town learn from another town's story? So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so I think, you know, it's a time to talk about this urgent moment that we're facing. Just in the past 10 years, over 100 people have been murdered in domestic terror, extremist violence, um, people being targeted because of their identity, their race, religion, um, identity. And it is, it's really hard to fathom that. And um, yet there are so many more people who are harmed every single day. And I think um, even told us about some of those events and and things that happen and trying to get a handle on that is so important and one of the reasons we're having this discussion today so Sarah let's go to the next slide so <clears throat> every year um, the FBI releases the report of hate crimes these are the official reports that law enforcement gets and then reports to the FBI and so the numbers usually look something like this, which is the last year we have comparative numbers, 7,000, I think 8,000 in 2020, the last year we have data for. But there's another arm of Department of Justice called the Bureau of Justice Statistics that has been aggregating reports from people about hate crimes that they have experienced, and they estimate an average of 250,000 every year. So there is incredible trauma in those unreported numbers. And I just think of, you know, the, the people like that interracial couple, what happened to them with their house being destroyed and attacked. I wonder how many other families have experienced something like that and either were too intimidated or afraid or didn't want to report to the police. How many traumatic incidents are happening? And as you say, even how many incidents of vandalism or an indication of future violence, right, that we that we need to keep track of. So I think, as you say, reporting hate crimes and creating an atmosphere in a community where people feel safe to report hate crimes and and that the community wants to hear about it and and address it together. That is really part of our mission. Um, not just to do that, because when we do that, when we hear about the most dramatic manifestations of hate, we can we can then deal with, you know, this idea that we all belong in a community that that each one of us is valued and um, and um, safe in the same way. So let's go on to the next one. Um, an example of so our films, we try to get at what we're seeing on the ground, and and our communities came to us. Uh, in the mid last you know decade and said we are seeing all these incidents of attacks on immigrants and where's the next not in our town story and we said well we can't really invent it it has to come from you know um, a community so when an Ecuadorian immigrant was killed um, in Patchog New York we saw this upsurge of community response it's really powerful um, response and so we went and started filming light in the darkness I think what's most disturbing when you think about underreported hate crimes is that 
Marcelo Lucero was killed in an attack by seven local high school students who had been roaming the streets of this town for months looking for so-called Mexicans to beat up. And many of the people tried to report it. There was a language barrier. Sometimes the police ignored them. Sometimes they, um, the, the, the people who were harmed were too in, afraid to report. So um, if we don't report, there is so many other people could get hurt. There is so much deeper harm. And um, I think it was that story is about how to change the atmosphere in a community um, so that these harms can be addressed. You just saw the film that we have recently completed an excerpt from Repairing the World, Stories from the Tree of Life. That was a, a film about, about what happened in Pittsburgh when 11 people were killed in an attack by um, a man who was, according to his social media, he still, his trial is not till next year. Um, his social media indicated he was motivated not only by anti-Semitism, but anti-immigrant attitudes. And um, so the film is really about the next three years in this town and what the amazing people of Pittsburgh have done to try to respond and um, create a, a safer atmosphere in their community. So we're looking forward to showing that in Cincinnati. Um, let's go to the next slide. I think I'm almost done and um, I know we have a lot to, to talk about. Um, let's go back to this, Julie, when, when we get a, uh, a chance to talk about next steps with United Against Hate Week. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Patrice. Um, I just sent Sarah notes saying I wasn't going to do my slides, but now I think I will. Be just because there's one slide, the third one that I really want to show, I really appreciate the different angles that everyone's coming at with the hate crimes that are happening. Um, and I just, for the people who are tuning in locally, um, Sarah, if you have my little slideshow, yeah. So Chris told you already that we started um, after Richard Spence was coming and after Charlottesville. On the next slide, you can get a look at the founding members of our committee. And there's more than this now, but these are the founding, 17 founding members that came together. Some started as interfaith and then branched out from there. And so now we're working with those. Um, and you can skip the next slide and go right to number four. So Ohio, um, if you're wondering, as we live in Cincinnati, we top the major crimes in Ohio, even though they've gone down. Um, we're second in the country for having 31 extremist groups active in our city, second only to California. And for the January 6th riots, we are number six when it comes to federal indictments of people that attended. So um, we like to take the global picture, which thankfully Patrice gave to us, and then what are we doing locally? So. Before I began here, I didn't really realize any of this was going on here. And part of the problem with not reporting is that people don't wanna draw attention and say, we have the second most extremist groups, but what gets measured gets managed. And so we building these trustful relationships with each other so that we can um, start to report. So we'll just go to my last slide if you can, Sarah. So what are we doing at the moment as a coalition? We are reactive. So if an incident takes place, we are supporting survivors. You already saw our 17 resource organizations. <clears throat> but say something happened to you and you don't want the attention or you're afraid. We can't, as a coalition, go to your community and offer a training. We can go and take the brunt of that and keep you anonymous, keep you supported and support you in that way. Being the scoreboard, we have a reporting site on our, um, an online tool on our website. So you can go there and we will not disclose your information to anyone else unless you want us to. But we really would like to keep track of what is going on. Schools, institutions really don't want to be known as a school with a ton of hate activity. But if we don't know what's going on, we can't fix it. So reshaping institutions, we are committed to, there are 52 neighborhoods in Cincinnati, into listening sessions in each of those, each of those neighborhoods to find out what is really going on what is and isn't being reported and hopefully can add to that data. So I think we've done a one, thank you, Sarah, wonderful and terrible job of showing what is really going on. And now I'd really like us to talk about those pathways forward and what we're doing well. Um, Karen, I know the amazing work that you've done and especially with your survey. So I hope you'll take us through that. Sure. 
And um, I did want to mention one thing, which is something that Ebum said is exactly, I, I wrote exactly what you wrote. In your work, you're trying to get a clearer view of what's going on in the community. And that's what we were trying to do with this survey as well, taking it from a slightly different angle. So um, Sarah, if you want to put my slides up very quickly, I'll just run through them. So we um, worked with our local ad council um, to put together a survey that would allow us to measure attitudes, beliefs, experiences vis-a-vis -vis discrimination and hate. Um, as I like to say, you know, we were reading, there's no shortage of, of pieces about what's happening nationally. And Patrice, you shared information and Ebun and Julie, I wanted to know specifically what was happening here in Rochester. So um, if you want to take us to the next slide, um, I don't think I've had a chance to say what our mission is. Um, and it is a slightly different angle from um, the other presenters in that I think we're a little bit more at the preventive end of, of the work. Um, so our mission is to unite the greater Rochester community in overcoming hate through education, dialogue, and positive action. Um, and, you know, for us, the education piece, I think, is so paramount. Um, many of our programs delve into our local history. Um, we've had the rebellion, you know, a rebellion that took place here in July of 1964. We want to have better understanding of what led to that. We have a speaker coming in for a summit that we have next month that, you know, that's her area of expertise. So um, we've done pieces about redlining and racist policies in our, in our community really trying to get ourselves more educated um, as to our history. Also the dialogue piece, which we were doing a pretty good job about until the pandemic. And then we've sort of all, you know, had to scatter and we're really hoping to pick that piece back up again. And certainly the positive action is another area that we um, want to be exploring a little bit more. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So as Julie said, um, we did this survey. Um, and these are the key findings. I'll go through them really quickly. Among the different types, and I'll show one slide about this, of discrimination, racial and ethnic discrimination definitely was um, the top, um, you know, as compared to discrimination based on gender, based on religion, based on sexual orientation, et cetera, and you'll see that. Um, discrimination is a theoretical concept for some and a daily experience for other. And this is certainly, I'm sure, like other communities, um, in this in this country, uh, there is segregation. Um, and for us here, the African American um, community uh, in the city, there's a very concentrated poverty. There is um, a lot of discrimination. Um, so that group in particular uh, had high reports on that. And then of course, disturbing and touching back to what some of you have talked about is um, groups that fear for their safety. So we'll look at the next um, slide. And I'll go through very quickly again. This is what I mentioned that discrimination based on race and ethnicity, over 50% of uh, people. And I should say very quickly, this was a nine county uh, a survey of people in nine counties surrounding the greater Rochester area. And we had about 850 respondents. So, uh, and representative samples um, across the various groups. So based on race and ethnicity, that was um, the highest uh, area of discrimination uh, LGBTQ um, came down, you know, to 30 from there, and you can look beyond that. Um, we'll look at the next slide, Sarah. Thank you for doing this. Um, this one in particular, I really want to highlight, and that is, we asked respondents compared to a couple of years ago, do you think discrimination against these various groups has increased? Decreased, stayed the same. Percentage that has increased. Now, I want you to look at the column in the left, the column in the right. If you start on the right, the general group is saying that discrimination against the African-American community has increased 31%, but among African-Americans, it's double. So perception and reality, quite different. Um, the same with LGBTQ, twice as many um, saying we are feeling increased discrimination. And I point to this next one, which I have to say really struck me, 65% um, of Jewish respondents said they feel discrimination has increased as compared to the perception, which is 15%. And I do think that what has happened often is anti-Semitism. People are, I think, not um, necessarily noticing or as aware um, or calling it out. Um, so this, I think, is where some of the disparity comes in here. 
Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, again, I really just want to bring your attention so we don't spend a ton of time on this, but if you look at that, the slides where I have um, in red, you'll see that in the past couple of years, the question is, have you felt discriminated against because of your race or ethnicity? And you'll see that the difference among blacks and whites is stark. Um, and somebody asked me just last night when I presented this, are, did white respondents feel they're being discriminated against? Yes, I think that there are, we know some of the, some of the rhetoric that we're hearing about um, sort of great replacement theory and other kinds of things. I think that there are people feeling um, in the white community that they're being discriminated against. Um, males, females, and again, among Jews, um, 46%, 9% Catholics and Christians. Um, we'll look at the next one very quickly. And this is the one about safety that also really strikes. Um, in the past couple of years, have you felt unsafe because of your race or ethnicity? And again, look at the stark differences there. Um, among blacks versus whites, it's double. Females and males, Jews showing 60 compared to 10%. So again, I think a lot of this is, um, you know, it's telling us a story. And unfortunately, I think the story is that these subgroups are all feeling um, increases and we're not as a whole entity um, realizing what those groups are experiencing. Sarah, I think the next slide is, um, right, so again, I'm gonna go really quickly here. These are the reasons for hope. And this is, I think, Julie, what you were trying to kind of get me to. I wanted to frame a little bit of it. We did ask questions that do give us some, some hope um, one of which is that in among these respondents, 73%, three quarters said they believe contributions of people from different races, ethnicities, religions, sexual orientations make our community stronger. Um, I have a lot in common with people in my community who are different from me, 59%. And I like this one, racism and discrimination are largely things of the past and don't affect li the lives of people in my community only 18% feel that way. In other words, over 80% recognize that racism and discrimination continue in the present and affect people in our community. Um, the next slide, do you favor policies that encourage diversity and inclusion? Look here, over half do, and only 15% strongly oppose. If we go to the next slide, similarly, most residents support more discussion of diversity in local schools history classes. I think that we know for a fact that they, we, there has been a lot of conversation, particularly social media, I think, but certainly out there um, about not wanting some of this history to be taught in schools. What we found here is over half support and only 14% strongly oppose. And I'll just point to the fact that 70% of parents so those who have skin in the game, they have kids in school are saying, we want our kids to be learning history that includes everyone. Um, I think there's only one more slide. Uh, this is also, um, do you feel students in greater Rochester should be taught the concept that racism is not only the product of individual bias, but something embedded in legal systems and policies? And again, we see definitely People with children in the household, 62% are saying yes, declines a little bit when they don't have in the household, and the lower numbers are those who oppose. So again, it is well over half and saying, yes, this, this is a concept that we should be learning, structural racism. Um, I think that might be the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That does provide some hope. And I, you know, I told you earlier I'm fascinated by the slides and, and brought a lot of hope from the whole um, work that you've done in that survey. And I know it was very challenging and maybe won't do it again for a while, but it was great. Um, so let's stay on that positive tip of what is working well or what are you proud of that you're doing in your organizations? Um, I'll open that up to everyone. So I think from a Department of Justice perspective, when we do learn of hate crimes in the community, um, we are able to mobilize with uh, both local and federal partners to bring 
strong cases. Um, I think the results that we've gotten in many of our hate crimes prosecutions is a testament to you know the dedication of the AUSAs and the agents who worked on cases. In some cases, you know, cases that are legally challenging, and we're still able um, to get. Uh, justice for those victims. So I'll say that's an area where it's working well. Hey, but will you also talk about the new initiatives or directives that you have become a part of in the last year or two? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, the Civil Rights Referral Initiative, I think is a great opportunity for us to have a continued uh, engagement with the public. Um, I don't think I mentioned earlier, but you know, it doesn't have to be that you yourself experienced an incident. You can report on other incidents that you've heard about in your community. Um, if you are part of a church or a local group and you want to raise the incident on behalf of someone that's you know one of your members and keep their identities anonymous, it's just helpful for us to you know be able to know what's going on and. Um, Obviously, we've been trying to do a great deal of outreach ourselves in uh, listening to the community and making sure that we're responsive. Uh, and then, as I said, um, we actually have an event uh, coming up November 9th. Um, and so that is a great opportunity where we're really hoping to hear from the public and, you know, kind of strategize on best ways to kind of support increased hate crimes uh, reporting. Yeah, I think um, Sarah just put a link to that event. It's, we'll talk more at the end, but it's a community listening session in Cincinnati at the Community Action Agency. It's going to be amazing. Patrice, did you want to talk about what you think is working well? I know you have. Yeah, and I guess, you know, count me in on the Hope Patrol. I, I, you know, I guess I would start by saying, I think we all know how much trouble we're in in our country. It is not, I don't think you can overstate it. It's it's serious, but there are an overwhelming number of people who want to stand up and want to do something. And if we only tell like what's wrong and not what possible, what's possible, um, I think it just draws people in more. And so that's what our films are about. That's what Not in Our Town is about. And that's why I guess, Karen, I, I, I think for us, prevention is the name of the game. And prevention looks like Cincinnati, right? Cincinnati Regional Coalition Against Hate. You're working to try to do something before additional hate crimes occur and to draw people into reporting them, as you say, Yvonne, so that the problems don't happen, as you are with the Levine Center. We have some groups that we've worked with for many, many years. Um, the group in Bloomington Normal, Illinois, has been uh, was the first not in our town group and they mobilize very quickly because they have a reputation in town of um, of not only uh, being able to respond they are both inside government some of our city council members some of them are not they're they're racially and ethnically diverse I think one of the most powerful things they ever did was to start a Not In Our School program that is run by two former counselors and they have a Not In Our School program in in every uh, school in both the districts of Bloomington and Normal. And those young people are on their game. When something happens, they call national, they call like community discussions. When there was a the Muslim ban that happened, you know, in 2017, um, the community and the young people said, we need to do something. And they filled an entire um, uh, auditorium with thousands of people saying you are welcome here um, when um, uh, an, an Indian man was killed in Kansas the young people of, of Bloomington said we need to draw attention to this happening we don't want this to happen in our town when Ferguson happened they were on the radio immediately in their town with their police chief the local um, leader of black organizations saying how can we make sure this doesn't happen? Is this a problem in our town? What do we do? So their continued and sustained activity has worked as a form of prevention. And 
you know, there's another group in Bowling Green, Bowling Green State and um, Bowling Green City of Bowling Green, Ohio, formed when there were racist incidents in um, in the town. And the there was a town and gown effort between the university and the city that continues to this day. They have monthly discussions. They take up actions and education. I feel a lot of hope, and I think giving people a frame and a way to engage um, for the long term is is what we need now more than ever. And you know, please go into NIAT.org and pull down some of our resources. And just everything's free; all the films are free. Just grab them and use them. It's you know, I think giving people a method for convening and getting together is the way to start. Yeah, I'll, Julie, I'll jump jump in if I can. I, um, you know, ditto so much of that. And Patrice, I'll start. I'll also say we have, we're not, not, I have so much respect for the work that you're doing and I love your resources. We've built some resources and we're more than happy to have people take a look at those too. We've had this kind of an opportunity where we've had uh, webinars that have been recorded. We've had um, uh, various things. We've had our two summits that were recorded and virtual. So I really, uh, want to offer that to people. Um, the more, like you say, the more that we share uh, our our inspiration and our um, toolkit, et cetera, I think the more that we build, um, you know, strengthen the bench. Um, I want to answer the question that you asked, Julie, about what are we what are we most proud of? And um, I'll say, for one, um, the fact that we focus on all forms of hate. Um, we have done programs on anti-black racism when we saw Asian American Pacific Islander community being attacked, um, we put a three-part series together, which is on our website um, called Asian Matters. And it was a really looking at our local community, history of anti-Asian uh, discrimination, et cetera. Um, we've done work on anti-Jewish hate. We've done anti-trans and LGBTQ hate. Um, so we're really um, proud of the fact that we've been able to address um, so many different areas and really involve so many impacted communities. Um, and again, the educational content we've been able to create, I feel really proud of. Um, the other thing is, and I think it, you know, for people watching, it uh, is important to make the point that um, we need buy-in from leaders of all kinds. And so we've had a steering committee since we started that uh, really rolled their sleeves up, helped us determine what our mission would be, helped us, um, you know, sort of decide our areas of focus, community engagement, youth engagement, um, really, you know, had some input into programming, et cetera. We've had the good fortune now to go from just myself to I've been able to hire some staff. And now um, we have steering committee members that get to sort of back off a little bit, but continue to be the ambassadors for us. And um, we've had some transition because it's been four years. And I have to say, um, we I have not had somebody, we have eight new steering committee members and I had nobody say no to me when I asked them to join. And we created a corporate council uh, because we recognize that many of our steering committee members are from the nonprofit sector, um, from the education sector, et cetera. And we wanted to be sure we were engaging the business community. And those business leaders also said yes. So I'm really pleased and proud and happy to have those folks um, working really arm in arm with with us um, and being out there doing, you know, sort of the reconnaissance, letting us know what they're seeing in their spaces and how we can um, be able to do this work. Um, and then last, I'll just say, you know, partner, partner, partner. Um, we when we came on the scene, we were very, very clear that we would not displace any great work that was happening. We wanted to partner. We wanted to elevate. We wanted to support. So we do a lot of work with the Urban League, the YWCA here locally, um, with a variety of organizations and with local uh, colleges that are doing really fantastic work. Um, we're here to fill in gaps and to um, really see where we can do partnership um, with them, which is why I love this coalition in Cincinnati, because I think, you know, we, we sort of tried to do a little bit of that on our own um, with COVID and had some success, you know, I tried to pull um, group together, but, um, I just think that is really so important. Very last thing I'll say, um, we have a youth ambassador council, uh, eight young people um, from a variety of schools, um, diverse in, it, it, I, I'm always saying it, with eight people, it's amazing you can get that much diversity, but we have 
diversity in uh, race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, even grade in school from freshmen to seniors. And um, they are doing tremendous work. We have an amazing youth engagement coordinator. So uh, it gives me incredible hope to see what they're doing in their spheres of influence, what they're bringing um, to the table, who they're bringing to the table. So I'll stop there. I feel very proud of the work that we're doing. And I think um, it there's a lot, a lot of bad, but there's more good. Uh, and I don't mean to be uh, I, I'm definitely not trying to be um, saccharine about it, but I don't. I think, as you said, Patrice, if we don't lift up the good stuff that's happening, we become helpless and hopeless. Um, and I see where uh, there's just so many people interested in really doing something. Um, to at the end of the day, Patrice, I think you said it. It's really it, it's our democracy that's at stake. It's our uh, our society that's at stake. Perfect. Thank you so much, Karen. Amazing. Um, before we get to our action steps, because we're just running through it, uh, Ava, is there anything just about how we can call people into this work or where you think we're headed? What's our next future steps before even United Against Hate Week? Do you feel like we're on a good trajectory now that we've changed administrations? What are you thinking? How are we looking moving forward? Where are we headed? Well, I, I mean, I think it is notable that the White House has taken a very aggressive stance. Um, I think just September 15th, the White House had a United We Stand Summit, which really brought in a lot of individuals um, hoping to counter some of the hate-fueled violence in our society. And I think each uh, agency has really taken on the mantle of trying to figure out how we can address hate uh, in our respective arena. So the Attorney General has really launched this United Against Hate initiative, which we've talked about in passing. But you know, the Southern District of Ohio is one of 16 districts who have been chosen to really participate in this program um, and really uh, highlight uh, the importance of prioritizing community outreach around hate crimes because we recognize this isn't something really that we can impose from a top down. It's going to take us all working together and collaborating to really address this issue uh, and really to make sure that, you know, um, these incidents can be addressed because they do pose significant uh, challenges for our national security. Julie, can I ask you what gives you hope since you have been steeped in this work for many years as well? I, I think it would be good to hear from you too. Well, thanks Patrice. Um, what gives me hope is every community that I've connected with um, and every person who's been a victim or a survivor has said, I'm so glad you're there. We're so glad. The support is, well, how can we help you? What can we do next? But really people are just glad to know that we're doing the work. So I'm so grateful to be doing the work. And then every place that I've gone has embraced us. So I'll, I'll jump ahead to, we're gonna let Patrice tell us about what United Against Hate Week is, but the Not In Our School resources are gonna be used throughout the greater Cincinnati area. Um, the excitement level of, I'm just going to speak about your bullying program. So everyone in the middle school will receive a blank um, map of the school. And anonymously, they're going to put where they think the hate and bullying incidents are taking place. And the next day, we're going to have an assembly where we're going to discuss what those different places were. Then we'll have student-led action about what to physically do. What can we do? What can you do that will create a physical change in this building? And then we have a commitment from the administrators that, by, that they will pick one to three of the ideas and implement them within a month and we'll come back and check in with them. So we've gotten like three schools signed on and we don't even have any like, look at what we've created already. But people are like hungry, right? So the hope is people are hungry for this work and excited to do it. And then we'll take the pledge against hate. And then we will have an assembly where people working collaboratively together is a way of unothering each other, right? <clears throat> so people from different grades, from different cliques, from different lunchroom tables will create these pledges against hate together and show them together. So the hope really does come from, I haven't met a person who hasn't said, what can, can you come to our school? Can you come to our location? Can we do a listening session? 
people are hungry and we're all isolated in a really awesome like tech bro I met in Cincinnati said we should be throwing anti-hate parties I'm like who would do that and he said you know they are gathering every weekend and they are coming together and we are not they are mobilizing on the weekends and we are sitting at home feeling sad and so these meetings together I know that I've met with each of you individually and I am energized after speaking with all of you. And so those, I was like, you know what? He might be right. Anti-hate parties where we're coming together to save democracy and be positive. That gives me hope. I'm very excited about that. So thank you. Patrice, tell us all about United Against Hate Week and how you started that and what's going on. Oh man, I am just so excited about that and and what you're doing in Cincinnati. So, <clears throat> Every year since 2017, you know, Karen, as a reminder, all of you of what Charlotte's did, Charlottesville did to wake many people up to the dangers of hate groups in the Bay Area. <clears throat> Our communities had many hate groups coming to town. Threat of violence was in the air quite prominently. And so our municipalities, our local cities started printing these, these posters that said, you know, our city stands united against hate. And you started seeing them all over the Bay Area. And we brought them together at our office in Oakland, some of these city leaders, and we said, what do you wanna do next? And we came up with this idea about a week of action. And we started that in 2018, and it's been going ever since. It is spreading everywhere. And we are so excited about what we can learn from Cincinnati. and and what's happening um, across our state in California and so many other places. Maybe it can start in Rochester, Karen, and we can learn from Rochester. There's some amazing folks there, I know. Um, so the idea is that you you put, put this out, share the resources and ideas, and you bring out the creativity in your local community. Maybe it's like, we're gonna have four anti-hate parties during United Against Hate Week, and or we're going to do this many things in a school. Many people are doing screenings as a way to open up discussion. That's why we offer the films for free. I think there are so many examples. One of the one of the ideas that I love the most is there's a game store in Berkeley, California, and they said, we're gonna play collective action games. We're gonna play games that people solve problems together, and so people gathered during that week to do that. So, um, you know, there are all kinds of creative things that people can do. Sometimes they have a march to their town saying, we're together, you know, joined in our, um, uh, supporting our diverse community. So many things to do on unitedagainsthateweek.org. Um, you can find examples and we look forward to sharing the examples that emerge from, from your town too. Thank you. And I accidentally just joined it last year, not knowing it was only in the Bay Area. And I said, but we're in Cincinnati. Can we do it too? And they said, yes. So now we're nationwide. Um, Avon, you spoke quickly about the forum that we're going to do on November 9th. Do you want to talk about the partners that we're going to work with? Uh, yes. So um, we are going to work with the coalition. Uh, obviously, <laughs> and the community uh, action agency is hosting. Um, so, and we expect that there will be representatives from local law enforcement as well as federal law enforcement, all of whom um, are dedicated to uh, making sure that you know we address uh, hate crimes and hate incidents appropriately. Um, there's a large team at the U.S. Attorney's Office which goes to show you that there is this hunger to be part of uh, the solution and not just uh, look at the problem. So um, it's November 9th from 5.30 to 7. Um, and we really hope that uh, people come out. Yeah, and there's a link to everything we're talking about in the chat, um, including the flyer for that event. It's part of our pre-United uh, Against Hate Week because as Evelyn said, she's a litigator and she has a case the next week. So we're going to do that. Um, Karen, you want to talk about what's coming up for you? Sure. I wish that we could offer it uh, virtually, but this year we are finally getting to do our Brave Spaces Rochester Summit to End Hate in person. 
locally on October 21st. Uh, we have really terrific speakers. All the information is on our website. And, you know, what I would say is we, I love like steal everything, you know, take ideas. I mean, maybe that's not the right word to use, but I, um, I went to the summit in Cincinnati that was organized, as I think I mentioned earlier, by Jackie Congedo uh, four years ago. And I came back here and said, this is what we need to do. Um, Patrice, we want to do United Against Hate Week here. So now that I've got more staff, we're going to do that. Um, but yeah, that's our, our most uh, thing coming up uh, shortly. And, um, you know, just have a lot of other things on the horizon um, as well. I did want to, while I have the floor, I just wanted to put one, one thing out there, um, just in terms of sort of, uh, you know, because I'm looking at the time, like some my own final remarks. Um, here's what I would love to leave people with. Um, one, learn, read, uh, talk with people, be curious. I think that's how we unother. I love that I wrote that down, Julie. Two, get off of social media. Um, I think that too many times we think we're having dialogue and we're not, um, we're in our echo chambers. Three, I would say the killing of George Floyd was an inflection point and we cannot lose that moment and momentum. Um, and four, where there's hate, there's opportunity to examine and challenge it. We need to spend time getting to know each other's stories. Uh, I think Patrice uh, is the master storyteller here in this panel and we, um, we really need to be doing that, that kind of work. That's my closing statement. Anyone else have a final statement or anything they'd like to say before we thank all our friends for being here? Well, I, I can't wait to meet everyone in person and for us to be together. I, I noticed that, you know, it's been so hard with the pandemic. I've just been at a series of events um, uh, in, in Pittsburgh for the Eradic Eradicate Hate Global Summit and then in New York to do some screenings there of the film and there's nothing like that experience of being together and i hope we can do that again soon and and learn from each other um, we know from years and years and years of this work that we are so much stronger than these groups who hate and we just need a way to mobilize ourselves and give our communities a way to take action so that can be shown and really excited to learn from all of you and your communities. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard to top um, what my panelists said. I think um, all of this speaks to a need to work together, um, to gather the data, to shout, to share stories and really to act. So. Uh, we thank you and, you know, please uh, contact the U.S. Attorney's Office. Julie, yes. and if I can say one last uh, thank you to Sarah for being the person in the background that has yes, kept you, us all the tech work and all the stuff in the chat box. Agreed. Um, and also, um, if you'd like to be a part of the work in Cincinnati or you can go to CincinnatiCoalition.org, all of the links will be in the chat, so grab those if you can. And this recording will be posted on YouTube um, underneath the National Underground uh, Railroad Freedom Center site. Um, but if you pledge against hate or volunteer with us for United Against Hate Week, we'll be hosting a human library. We will have book um, um, curated book collections, hopefully in the libraries and several local bookstores. We will be doing a book club. There's a lot going on. So if you're in the city and you have some energy and you want to get involved, email us, we will come and grab you and make sure we all get to do it together. I'm so grateful to the Freedom Center and to Christopher Miller and to Sarah and to these amazing women who are doing this wonderful work that we will continue to do together. Um, and hopefully this will become annual and next year we can come back and talk about all the amazing things that we've all gotten to do. I'm very grateful to all of you, so. Thank you. We do, we hope you enjoyed this webinar. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great night.